about just the, the recording that we had on, during this uh, semester can you just can you like send it to like to me like an email or because i would like to to save them so whatever i'm having like difficulties i just go back and mm -hmm. um if you want i can send you a link to the youtube page that they're all posted on okay all of my recordings that I do for all of my classes get posted on my same uh, YouTube page. Okay. So if you want, I can make sure to either post a link or send you a link for that. So yeah, you can, if you want to sometime in the future, you can go back and look at. Okay. Thank you so much. Information. No worries. All right. Just made a note to myself there. All righty. So like I said, today we're going to be kind of covering the very last, let me make sure I got the right one here. Yeah. The very last set of new material for the term. And so normally I'd spend an entire week kind of going through this with you guys and talking about lots of different examples and doing lots of different problems. Um, but today I'm just going to kind of give you the really super short and sweet, simple overview of everything. So let me pull that up here. Um, so like I said, our final exam for this class has been posted already. You are free to work on it at your leisure. Um, it is due at the end of the day on Thursday, February 25th. So please, please make sure that you get it turned in by the end of the day on Thursday. So today we're going to kind of continue on with our physics part of IPC and look at the different laws of motion, which are descriptions of how things move in the natural world based on the different forces that are around us. They're often called Newton's laws of motion after Isaac Newton, this guy pictured here generally considered one of the smartest human beings to have ever lived. Not only did he describe these laws of motion and kind of help develop this aspect of physics, he also came up with the form of math known as calculus. And so he was trying to describe things and he couldn't figure out how to do it. So he came up with his own new version of math in order to describe things. Um, so Isaac Newton, a huge player, in the math and science field back in, I want to say like the 16 or early 1700s is where he's from. So today we're talking about Newton's laws of motion. And there's three main laws that we're going to be talking about. There's the law of inertia, there's the force equation, and there is the action-reaction law. Um, so each one of these, especially the first law and the third law, we could spend a whole day talking about. But today I'm going to try to give you sort of like the basic introduction, the basic overview of each one of these. So the first law that we're going to talk about states that an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside or unbalanced force. Uh, the second law has to do with the force equation, which is force equals mass times acceleration. And the third law, our action-reaction law, states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So for each one of these, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about exactly what it means, as well as some examples to help you kind of picture it in your mind. So we'll start off with the first law of motion. An object at rest, which at rest doesn't mean sleeping, it means like not moving or stopped. So an object that is still will stay still, and an object that is moving will stay moving unless acted upon by an unbalanced or outside force. So that's kind of a lot of sciencey type jargon in there. But what exactly does that even mean? 
Essentially, it means that an object will keep doing what it was doing in the same way, unless acted upon by some sort of outside unbalanced force. What this means is that if an object is sitting still, it will remain stationary, remain sitting still. If an object was moving at a constant velocity, a constant speed, it will keep moving. It will only change its motion if there is force that acts on it. Right, so if I have my mouse here, my computer mouse, the one that I use to move the little laser pointer dot around the screen, if I take my mouse and I sit it down on top of my desk, it's right now is staying still. It is, in science terms, at rest. So what that means is that unless I touch it or unless somebody else touches it, unless my dog hits my desk and moves it, unless an earthquake happens and knocks it to the floor, unless a big gust of wind comes through the window and pushes it, unless some other force acts on my computer mouse, it will stay still. It will remain at rest. It will stay stationary. So when an object is not moving, it will not start moving until some sort of outside force acts on it. Things don't just start moving randomly all on their own. There has to be some sort of force acting on an object in order to get it to move. Same thing with when things are moving. So if something is moving, it takes force in order to either change its direction or to slow it down and stop it. Right? If you're moving along the road in a car, you have to press on your brake in order to get your car to slow down and stop. The force from the brake pushing on the wheel is what slows and stops your car. So we need some sort of force to act on our objects in order to either make them move or change their motion. So I keep saying an unbalanced force or an outside force. So the reason why I say that is because objects, especially objects on Earth, are undergoing forces all the time, particularly the force of gravity. So everything on Earth is being affected by the force of gravity. Gravity is pulling everything down towards the ground, right? If I have my pen here, and I let go, the pen falls because gravity pulls the pen down towards the ground. So if there's nothing to oppose gravity, there's nothing keeping that object up, the object will just fall, go towards the ground. If there is something there, like a table, in this case, we have our physics book, which is this little picture here, sitting on our table or our desk. Gravity is pulling the book downward. So the book is always feeling the force on gravity. In this case, however, that's balanced by the force from the table, which is essentially keeping the book up. It's pushing up on the book in order to keep it off the ground. So the force from the table and the force from gravity are balanced. There's an equal force pulling the book down versus keeping it up. So the book remains at rest. It stays still. This book is not going to move unless somebody comes in and picks it up or pushes it to one side or the other or shakes it around or something like that, exerts some other force on it. If the only forces are gravity and the table, then those are balanced and the book will remain still. It will not move. So when you have these balanced forces, the object experiences no change in motion. This book isn't going anywhere unless some other unbalanced force comes and moves it. So sometimes people also call the first law, the law of inertia. So inertia is a fancy science word 
that essentially describes how the mass of an object, its weight, makes it resist changes in its movement, right? Inertia basically says heavier things are harder to move. So the more mass that an object has, the harder it is to get it to change its motion, right? This pen, I can very easily move it up and down because it is very light. It has very low inertia. If I had like a bowling ball or like a boulder that I was carrying around, that would be very difficult to move around because that has a lot of inertia. So if something is very heavy, right, it's hard to get it to start moving. It's hard to move it away from rest. And if there's very something very heavy that's traveling, then it's hard to make that object change direction or speed up or slow down. So the heavier an object is, the harder it is to start moving, stop moving, go faster, or change direction. And it's all due to inertia, how objects with more mass have more resistance to their motion. Heavier things are harder to move is basically what inertia is saying. A simple concept, but put into more sciencey kind of terms. So here's a very good example. We have these two buckets here. One is not filled with anything, and one is filled with sand. So our first law, our law of inertia, says that if nobody messes with these buckets, then they're going to stay still. They're not going to move because there's no force going on here. But if you come over and push these buckets, the empty bucket has less inertia than the sand bucket. It's a lot easier to push the empty bucket and make it swing back and forth versus the sand bucket. This guy is a lot heavier. Sand is pretty dense material. So it's harder to push it back and forth. It has more inertia. On the other hand, if these buckets were swinging and you're walking by and you're about to get hit by one, I'd rather be hit by the empty bucket than the full bucket. Because the empty bucket has less inertia, so it takes less effort for me to stop the bucket from moving. The full bucket has more inertia, and so it is going to require a lot more effort. It's gonna be a lot more painful for me to stop that bucket of sand with my body versus the empty bucket. So it all has to do with the difference in mass and how that relates to inertia. Less mass, easier to be pushed and moved. More mass, harder to be pushed and moved. And harder to slow it down once it does get moving. Um, here are just some other inertia examples. We're going to kind of skip over things. Uh, so again, if an object has a large amount of inertia, if it's moving, it'll be hard to slow it down or speed it up. If it's at rest, it'll be hard to make it start moving. And if it's moving, it'll be hard to make it change direction. The more mass, the larger inertia, and the more difficult it is to change the direction or the movement of that object. So for another good example of how unbalanced forces work on objects, if an astronaut floating around in space for some reason has a rock that he took with him and he goes and flies out of the space shuttle and throws that rock in, into space, the law of inertia, the first law, says that that rock is going to keep moving in that same direction at that same speed until some other force acts on it, until maybe it hits a asteroid or it's sucked in by the gravity of a different planet, who knows? But until that happens, the first law says that this rock is gonna keep moving in a straight line forever and ever. 
So the reason why I mentioned that this happens out in space is that we know here on Earth, if you throw something or if you roll something along the ground, it isn't exactly going to keep moving forever and ever, right? It's probably going to fall to the ground or roll to a stop. And that's because there are a lot more different types of forces here on Earth than there are in space. Um, so here's a really good example of inertia in action. So the first law says that objects that are in motion will keep it want to stay in motion. So this car here and this guy are in motion. They're both traveling at 80 kilometers an hour, which would be about like, I don't know, 45, 50 miles an hour. So they're both traveling at this speed. And then this brick wall here stops the car, right? This brick wall exerts a big force on the car and makes the car come to a complete stop very quickly. However, this guy thought he'd be really cool and is not wearing his seatbelt in his convertible sports car. And so he is very strongly affected by the first law of motion because the car hits the brick wall and stops its motion. The man does not have that brick wall to stop him. He's also not wearing his seatbelt, which would stop him. So the first law says that this man will want to keep moving in the same direction that he was moving until some sort of outside force stops him. Uh, in his case, unfortunately, it looks like that outside force is going to be gravity and the pavement on the other side here. So even though the car stopped, the man was still moving at 80 kilometers an hour. And so inertia says that he's going to keep moving that fast until it's stopped by some other force. So this is why seatbelts are super important. They provide that force to help stop you when a, out, some outside force stops your car. So instead of being stopped by the windshield or the front of your car or the wall that your car hit or the pavement on the other side of the wall, you're stopped right here by your seatbelt. So both things are moving at the same velocity. The car stops because of this force, but the man does not have that same force, so he keeps going, all because of that first law of motion. Objects in motion will tend to stay in motion. Same thing with this example here. This lady is carrying a rake on top of her wheelbarrow, going along, hits a rock with the wheel of the wheelbarrow, but the rake still keeps moving in that direction, right? This rock exerts a force on the wheelbarrow, but it does not exert a force on the rake. So while the wheelbarrow stops right here, the rake keeps moving. Because that first law says that objects in motion will stay in motion until some sort of force acts on it. This rake hasn't had a force act on it exactly the same way quite yet, so it is going to keep moving. So, like I was saying earlier, things on Earth rarely move forever, right? And that's because we have a lot of unbalanced forces on Earth that act on things that are in motion. One of those is the force of friction, which is a force produced when two things, two or more things rub against each other. So as like a ball rolls along the ground or as a book slides across the table, it'll naturally slow down and stop because of the force of friction. Friction acts in the opposite direction and slows down things that are moving across the surface. It is an unbalanced force on these objects. There's also a force that we talked about earlier called gravity. So if you throw a ball straight up in the air, 
the ball is not going to keep moving up in the air forever because gravity is an unbalanced force that's pulling that ball back down to the ground, right? There's a lot more force on gravity pulling the ball down than there is force from the air pushing the ball up. So especially as things roll along the ground or fly through the air, there are multiple different forces that are acting against them and causing them to slow down and change their motion. So friction, like I mentioned, happens whenever a object moves across some sort of surface. So like in this case, when you're, say when you're riding a bike, right, you can, at first you're at a stop and then you start pedaling, 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 you're applying a lot of force to the pedals, so you're moving in the forward direction. Once you stop pedaling, though, there's this friction force between your bike tire and the ground. And that friction force is causing you to lose velocity, to slow down. So friction is acting in the opposite direction than the way that your bike is moving. So this is why if you're pedaling, pedaling, and then lay off the pedals and just coast for a while, yeah, you'll probably be able to travel for a little bit. But eventually, even though there might not be any other forces acting on you, you will slow down and stop. And that's because friction is slowly acting against the motion of your bike. So the friction of your bike wheels across the pavement is causing you to slow down. So that's why when I mentioned about the example earlier of the astronaut in space, in space there is no friction. There is no moving across a surface or a gravity. So objects in space can just go at a constant velocity until they're acted upon by some force. Here on Earth, almost all objects are acted upon by friction and by the law of gravity. And so usually we, or the machines that we use, have to apply force of our own in order to overcome that friction or that gravity. Uh, momentum, we're gonna kinda skip over. It's sort of related to inertia. Answer. Okay. So the main takeaway from that first law is that things do not change their motion unless some outside unbalanced force acts on them. So objects that are at rest, that are staying still, are going to keep staying still. Objects that are moving are going to keep moving in the same direction until some sort of other force comes and acts on them. That could be you putting force into moving that object. That could be friction or gravity changing the motion or slowing down the motion of that object. But objects that are still or objects that are moving will stay that way unless some sort of other force acts upon them. All right, so I know that was a whole lot of stuff that I just touched on with the first law there. Um, does anybody have any questions about that first law of motion so far? No. Okay, great. Thanks, Keith. Doesn't sound like it. So the next thing that we're going to talk about a little bit simpler and kind of more straightforward It is the second law of motion, Newton's second law, which states that the force of something can be calculated by doing mass times acceleration. So if you take the mass of an object and you multiply it by the acceleration, which is how quickly it is speeding up or slowing down, 
So did it get really fast in a really short amount of time or did it slowly increase in speed over time? But whatever the acceleration is, an acceleration can be either getting faster or getting slower. Whatever that change is, that times the mass gives us the force that was acted upon that object. So force equals mass times acceleration. You'll often see this written as F equals M times A or just a simple F equals MA. What that stands for is force equals mass times acceleration. If you know the mass of your object and you know how quickly it is changing speed, then you can easily calculate the amount of force that was imparted on that object. So this equation, this calculation, gives us a relationship between force, mass, and acceleration, which essentially means that if one of them increases, then one of the other ones will likely increase or has to increase as well. So when it comes to the relationship between force and acceleration, if you have this cart right here that has a certain mass to it, so it's just got this one little box on it, not particularly heavy. If you put in a certain amount of force, you'll get a certain amount of acceleration. You'll cause that cart to speed up a certain amount. If the mass stays the same, if you put in more force, then you get more acceleration, right? If you push on this cart harder, it's gonna move faster. If your force goes up and your mass stays the same, this equation says that your acceleration will have to go up as well. So this makes sense. If you have two objects that are the same, the harder you push them, the faster that they will travel. So the harder that you push this cart, the quicker you'll be able to get it to accelerate. You can also think about the relationship between force and mass. So the more mass that you have with your object means you'll need more force in order to get a certain acceleration. So for example, if you have this wagon here that you're pulling and it has one, I don't know, whatever this is, stone bird bath or something on it, and that's going to require a certain amount of force to pull it, to get it to start moving. If you put a lot more of those stones on it, it's going to require a lot more force in order to pull it at the same acceleration, in order to get it to increase its speed the same amount, right? Again, this stuff makes sense, right? The heavier that something is, the more force you need to put into it to get it to move. Um, but with that force equals mass times acceleration, it gives us a way of calculating that. So again, if your mass increases, if you're dealing with a heavier object, then to get it to go the same acceleration, you'll have to do more force. So if your mass goes up, then your force will also have to go up in order to get it to move the same way. Heavier things take more force. You can also use this second law if you want to do actual calculations. So like people are playing soccer, there's a lot of forces that are being exerted on this soccer ball at different times. So the ball has a certain mass, it's not particularly heavy. So they're able to kick it with a lot of force and cause that ball to accelerate, right? You kick it really hard and the ball shoots off, hopefully into the goal or to somebody else on your team. So if you know the mass of the ball, and if you have somebody there like with a uh, like radar gun from the police and they can measure the acceleration of the ball, then you can use that to calculate exactly how much force was exerted on the soccer ball. 
so the force exerted on the ball is equal to the mass of the ball, how heavy it is, times the acceleration, how quickly you're able to make that ball move when you kick it. So F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. And that's pretty much it for the second law. It's a really simple equation and a really basic one, but it really perfectly calculates and compares how force, acceleration, and mass are all interrelated to each other. Generally, if one of them goes up, then one of the other ones is likely going to have to increase as well. So I know that one was relatively simple, but does anybody have any second law questions so far? Anything about the second law of motion you still want to ask about? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. All right, so the next one and probably one of the trickier ones that we're going to talk about today is the third law of motion, also often known as the law of action and reaction. So one of the ways of stating the third law is that when one object exerts a force on the second object, the second one exerts a force back on the first that is equal in magnitude, meaning the same amount, and opposite in direction. So other ways of saying this, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So this means that when one object exerts a force on another, that other object exerts a force back on the first one. Uh, so this one is kind of tricky to talk about just using like definitions. So I really like to use a lot of examples to kind of help make this law clear. So a really good example is rocket engines. And this picture is kind of OK, but I like this one more. So in order to make a rocket lift off and go up into the air, it burns a ton of fuel and gases in the engine, which produce these hot egg gases, which then escape out the bottom of the engine, of like the rocket. So there's gases and fire and smoke shooting out the bottom of the rocket. So the third law says that as the gases move downward, they'll put a force on the rocket in the opposite direction. So as the gases move down, the rocket moves up. And that's because of this third law of motion. So the downward movement of the gases causes an equal and opposite direction, equal and opposite reaction on the rocket ship. And that causes it to lift off and go up. So the gases are exerting a force, are being forced downward. That exerts a force on the rocket ship that is going upward. So this is how rockets take off. They produce tons of force down, which then pushes the rocket up. Hold on, let me go. My door got cracked open here. There we go. So third law is all about these equal and opposite actions, equal and opposite forces interacting. So you all are actually experiencing the third law of motion right now without even realizing it. So whenever two different objects interact, they exert forces on each other. So this is kind of very similar to the idea of the first law with the balanced forces. So when you sit in a chair, gravity is pulling your body down because it's gravity and that's what it does, but the chair is resisting gravity and pushing your body up. 
So your body is exerting a downward force on the chair, and the ch but at the same time, the chair is exerting an upward force on your body. And this is what allows it to keep you sitting up off the ground. So every action, every force is going to have an opposite force exerted on it. Mm -hmm. So birds are another great example. Birds fly through the air by flapping their wings, which generates a force called lift, which brings them up into the air. So you can see in this picture right here in this little video that the bird's wings are exerting force down on the air, right? The wings are coming up and then going back down. And when the wings exert a force down on the air, the air exerts a force back up on their wings. So you see that when the wings go down, the body of the bird goes up because the wings going down, pushing on the air, causes the air to push back on the wings in the body of the bird. And this is what lifts it and allows it to fly through the air. So third law, it's all about equal and opposite actions. Bird pushes the air down, the air pushes the bird up. Another good example that I really like is if you think about when you're on like a skateboard or in my case, a rolly desk chair. If you're standing or sitting on one of these objects that can roll across the ground pretty easily, and you go up to a wall or a desk and push against the desk, right? So if I push towards you guys, and actually I should be able to do it right here, yeah. So if I put my hands on my desk down here and I'm gonna push towards the camera, towards where you guys are sitting, you'll notice that my body moves away from the desk. That's because of the third law of motion. I'm putting force with my arms on the desk and pushing, but when I do that, the desk pushes back on me with an equal and opposite force, which since I'm on a rolly chair, causes me to go backwards, away from the desk. Same exact thing if you're standing on like a skateboard or something and you're up against a wall and you pushed off of it, you're pushing forward, but you're moving backwards because you're putting force on the wall, but the wall then puts force back on you. So this is what the third law of motion is all about. These action reaction forces. A force exerting one way results in a force pushing back the opposite way. Uh, another really good example I like that's similar to the uh, rocket ship example is that if you have a balloon and you fill it up full of air, right? It's a nice big balloon and then you have it, but you have to keep that neck of the balloon, the little bottom dangly part closed. Because what happens if you open it up, the air shoots downward out of the balloon. So the balloon is squeezing the air and it's causing the air to go down. When it does that, the balloon flies up and starts flying around in all these crazy directions. And that's because of the third law of motion. As the air rushes down out of the balloon, it pushes the balloon up and around the room. So opposite forces in opposite directions with equal magnitudes. Air is being forced down, and that movement causes the balloon to be forced up. Another example I really like is if you've ever seen somebody or been in the position where you're like on a boat and you're getting ready to hop off and go on to the shore, one mistake that you could make 
is standing right on the edge of the boat and then stepping to go towards the shore, right? Because the boat is exerting a force on you, which is allowing you to go forward, but you are also exerting a force back on the boat with your foot. And so you're pushing the boat backwards as you move forwards. And if you push too hard, you could end up with the reaction of face planting right in the water as the boat shoots out from under you. And it's all because of these opposite actions. So pushing yourself forward causes you to push the boat backwards. A similar thing happens when you're swimming through the water. So if you see people swimming, right, they don't swim forward by like thrusting their arms out in front of them, right? You swim forward by bringing your arm from your front and then pushing the water back and then pushing the water back and then pushing the water back. And that's because as you push the water backwards, the water pushes you forwards. So you're exerting force on the water. And because of that, the third law says that the water is gonna exert a force back on you. You're exerting a force backwards. So the water's force is gonna push on you to go forwards. And that's what allows swimmers to swim through the water. All of this due to this third law with these equal and opposite actions. This is just a whole bunch more kind of basic examples here. Uh, same thing with if you have like a tennis ball or a bouncy ball and you throw it against the wall of like your house or your school or something. When the ball hits the wall and it exerts a force on the wall, obviously, but then the wall exerts a force back on the ball. And that's what causes the ball to bounce off back towards you. So it's the force from the ball is then has the reaction of the force from the wall. And the initial force going in is then pushed back by the wall going out. So that is kind of the third law in a nutshell. That is this big complex definition of action and reaction and object is force on a second, the second exerts back on the fourth, first. It essentially all means that when you exert force on an object, that object will exert force back on you. Or whatever exerts force on an object will then have the force exerted back onto it. So there'll always be a equal and opposite force to any sort of interaction, any sort of um, transfer of forces. All right. So I know that one is kind of the trickiest one to wrap your head around. Um, but does anybody have any third law related questions? Anything about the third law of motion that you're still a little bit confused by? Alrighty, does not sound like it, which is good. I'm gonna take that to mean that I did an excellent job of explaining everything so nobody has questions about anything. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of the laws of motion in general? Um, there are at least two or three laws of motion questions that are on the exam. And I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about them on Thursday, since we just talked about them here so recently. Um, but does anybody have any final questions about any of the laws, oops, any of the laws of motion? Either the law of inertia, things will stay at rest and or in motion until acted upon. 
the second law, F equals MA, or the third law, any action, any force will have a equal and opposite reaction force. Any final uh, laws of motion questions? I don't have a question about that, but will these um, questions be any of these questions be on the test that we have that's uh, due Thursday? Mm -hmm. So there is, I think there's, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I want to say there's like two, three questions related to these on the exam due Thursday. Um, they're all pretty simple. Um, I tried to make them fairly easy since we didn't have that much time to talk about it. Um, but there will be a couple laws of motion questions on the exam, yes. Okay, thank you. No problem, good question. All right, so speaking of the exam, again, it has been posted today, but it is not due until Thursday. Um, so please take your time, work on it in chunks if you have to. You have all day tomorrow and all day Thursday to get it finished up and work on the exam. Um, because you guys, we had such a crazy week last week and you're gonna be busy with the exam this week. Um, I tried to make the daily assignments for this week pretty simple. So the one for today is just a simple question about the second law of motion and the equation that it describes. Um, and then the ones for Wednesday and Thursday are pretty similar to Monday's question, where it's just kind of general daily questions about like what went well for you in this class, um, what did you like or not like about the how the class was set up and stuff kind of like that. So nothing too hard, nothing that should take too much time so that you have as much time to work on the exam as possible. Again, we will have a review session on Thursday where we talk, well, I'll try to touch on everything that we've covered over the past several weeks that could be on the exam. And so please feel free to be there, ask questions. Um, if you're working on the exam and you're stuck or you have a little bit of difficulty and you can't quite figure something out. Uh, let's see what. Didn't want that one. 